Good morning, everyone. Um, it's nice that you're all here this morning. And we're going to continue our study on laying judges six, seven, and eight on their, their individual lines. But we, can we begin with a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for this morning, uh, for the rest that we had last night, and uh, for the tasks that you have given us today. We need your help in all that we do, and we need your presence in our lives, that we may reflect your character, and we need you in this study. And we invite your Holy Spirit to teach and direct and guide us and correct us. We also pray, Lord, for each person who is searching for truth, that you can enlighten their minds and strengthen their intellect, and that we can all uh, participate in understanding your word. Help us to sort through these lines and to understand the time in which we live. And we pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Now, yesterday we we um, we sort of got a, a bogged down. Maybe isn't the right word. We we went a little bit off track, but part of it was uh, to understand um, what had happened in um, when we were looking at these lines, which we're going to look at in a minute. What was happening uh, just prior to July eighteenth? So we were looking at these videos. Uh, Ron was here that night, and um, he was helping us uh, uh, with some of the, the WhatsApp chat and stuff that was going on at that time. And we know that Jeff presented his last presentation on July 11th, uh, 2020. He did two presentations, number 50 and 51 of uh, Daniel's Last Vision. And, and on July 10th, um, we had this this symbol, of course, the 10th day of the seventh month. Um, but that was this part of this structure uh, that we had from understanding the Mayan calendar in relation to um, Josiah Lich's prophecy. So it was rather involved. But we are trying to put these dates down uh, based on what we see in Judges uh, uh, chapter 7. And, and we had taken Judges 7.18, the blowing of the trumpet, to represent July 18. And we also had uh, the trumpet being blown in um, chapter 6, which, again, we used it for the same symbol. So we have these separate lines. And so I'll go to that. So here are the lines that we have that we were working on. <clears throat> so you can see I took Judges 7, verse 10 to 11, and lined it up with July 10th to 11th, 2020. Um, and we had done some very similar things with Chapter 6 as well. And now we have Judges 7, 18, which is July 18, 2020. So we have all of this structure at this point. Now, the way that I was explaining it yesterday is that Judges 6 is focusing upon its, its primary symbols are dealing with 9-11. And 9-11 is going to be um, a way mark on a line, which the line of Gideon, which, which we have titled this, is really there's three lines that we have with Gideon. And so when we zoom into the way mark of November 9th, it gives us this information um, that we can then place on a line for Judges 6. And then when we zoom into the July 18th date, it gives us a line that we can um, use to, under, to lay out a Judges 7. Now, it does, of course, begin with Judges 6, uh, the end of it. And then we're going to do the same thing with Judges 8. Now. When I originally I was looking at this, I was seeing this as a repeat and enlarge. 
And, and in some ways it is a repeat and enlarge when you zoom into a line and you, you, you get this line. And what we haven't done here with these lines is mark these way marks yet. And, and the fleece, of course, this hasn't been completed because we'd have to uh, try to see what the rest of Judges 7 is saying and where we would mark it. But we can see that Judges 6 doesn't bring us to um, directly to 2023. But it does cover this whole history of this movement that the period of the judges covers, right? But it's it's using the symbol of September 11th uh, to bring us to November 9th. So September 11th and November 9th are together. And then the March 7th and the December 26th date are the dates in which we started two different studies. Uh, the December 26th date is this study here of understanding the lines began on that date. And then March 7th, 2021, we had begun a study on um, an examining the foundation. So those these two different studies. So now we're um, um, we're going to finish this with Judges chapter seven. Now, was it it understandable? I mean, it was a little bit scattered dealing with um, July 10th and the 11th. Um, so we have the June 21st and the June 22nd date still here in this line, just as we do in the line above. But this line is emphasizing something different than the line above, even though it's covering some of the same way marks. So how, how would we understand these lines as far as you know, time of the end, a formalization of a message, et cetera. Um, so maybe before we move on, or maybe we should do this after. So we're gonna put the edit line here. So when we look at this line, so we're, so we're obviously going to change this. So, but you can see how this is kind of like a repeat and enlarge, but yet it is still a different emphasis in chapter seven than chapter six. Do people see that? For it to be an enlarge, it has to be a different emphasis. Mm-hmm. And, and you can see that if we're going to look at this line and we have a time of the end, obviously we can mark November 9th, 1989 as the time of the end. But if we're looking at this, this line in this way, um, we, would, we would then have to try to understand what way marks are being represented here. Because we haven't, we haven't labeled these way marks other than we can see this as the time of the end. And in, in the line below, I think we'd have to see September 7th, 2019 as the time of the end. You know, if you're going to put your, your way marks there. <clears throat> now, when we did this, we ended up with, with seven way marks, though I wasn't particularly thinking about numbering these way marks when, when we drew this out. I was thinking we need, we need seven. Um, this is just how, how we, we laid out Judges chapter six. So would November 9th be an empowerment or a formalization or what is it? Is it a formalization of November 9th, 1989? Does November 9th, 2019 give us something that, because it's 30 years, So is this a formalization? Is June 21st, 2022 uh, verse, uh, in 2020, is that uh, an empowerment? Would we put this as the first angel arrives, the first angel is formalized, the first angel is empowered? Would we say then that this is June 27th is somehow the second angel? 
it's formalized at July 18th, it's empowered here. And then this, you know, is that how we would do this? Or is there some other way in which we would understand this as a line? I would say the way you just approached it would be the would be the correct way of doing it. Okay. So so June 27th, 2020. Um, that one's not really fully understood, I think, by the movement. Um, but what was June 27th, 2020? What was the significance of it? Why would we mark that? as the arrival of the second angel. What, what is the par parallel that we would have in Millerite history? Okay, so if we took, if we took this from the beginning, yeah. FFA's ministry, we're placing it November 9th, 1989. Yeah. We have the prophet of Judges 6-8 making the claim, and then we have September 11, 2001. Mm -hmm. Now, we're looking at September 11 as the arrival. Of well, the first in, well, in this line, September 11th isn't the arrival of the first angel. Okay. In this line, September 11th is not really being marked. It's really November 9th, 2019 that's being marked but it's paralleling September 11th in, in, in how it's tying together this line, right? So the way that we looked at it is that they're the same symbol, but in this line, it can't be the, empower, the arrival of the second angel or the empowerment of the first angel. Because in this line, we, we have a different line. This, this is the line of this movement in relationship to time setting, right? Because, because this is the time setting of July 18th. But the first date we have is November 9th. So, so November 9th becomes a symbol of the formalization of this message as illustrated in Judges chapter 6. But we're placing that on the zoom in line that we're placing before this or be, be yeah. after this. Yeah, so we're zooming into, uh, because we have a line that has November 9th, 2019 on it, and that we're zooming into that line. That we're is- cho We're choosing to examine it more closely. Right, so we're examining it and we see that this Judges 6 is illustrating the significance of November 9th, 2019 which is also connected to July 18th, right? So in some ways, these, these lines line up. I mean, we can overlap them, but it's the emphasis of each of these lines that is different. And, and they have some way marks that are the same, but they're going to have some that are different. So we're going to get to uh, the two way marks here uh, at the end after Judges 718, which we haven't got to. So it says fleece one, fleece two, but obviously that's not what's gonna be there. Now, so then if we have uh, the message of, that's gonna be published in the Tennessean, we're gonna mark June 21st and June 22nd, and that would be Judges 621 and 622, which becomes an empowerment of that message. But then we have June 27th, which I'm saying is the arrival of the second angel in this line. That, that in the understanding of this line, this was dealing with November, November 9th, 2019, that we have now this June 27th date. Now, the June 27th date isn't, isn't well understood. I mean, the, the primary thing that we looked at first was it was... Um, well, it's 21 days before July 18th. So when we first got to June 27th, um, and even just prior, uh, we were talking about how this parallels Daniel in Daniel chapter 10, uh, the three weeks that he's fasting, right? Because he's going to receive light about what is happening in, in um with this decree 
of, of Cyrus's decree, right? Okay. So, so we have this June 27th, but the significance of June 27th uh, was further seen in its connection to um, the pandemic and it's and 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 what would that be? How did we understand the significance of June 20, 27th? <clears throat> People not remember why we picked this date. Was this the day that the money that had been paid to the Tennessean was refunded? Um, I don't know. Um, but prior to that date, even prior to June 21st, we had already found its significance. That is, it's 1260 days from when Jeff first predicted the pandemic. That's going to okay. be January 14th, 2017. But it's also 273 days before March 27th, 2021, right? So March 27th, which is the symbol of the Levites, is 252 days past July 18th. So if you add the three weeks, you're going to get the 273. And But we had already noticed that there was 1,533 days from January 14th, 2017, to March 27th, 2021. That means 1260 plus 273 is 1533. Which, as Elder Jeff had pointed out several times, if you have the 1533, you also could equate that with the 1335. Yeah, you you, you can mix those two together. But we also have the 1260 here, too, in this context as well. So you have symbols of the 1260, the 1335, and the 1533, which goes from August 11, 1840, to October 22nd, 1844. Now, June 27th also is uh, from Samuel Snow's letters. That's the publication of his Pentecost letter that he wrote on June 22nd. Um, It also connects us to um, uh, the prophecy of uh, the 40 days and 390 days from Ezekiel chapter 4 verse 6, because it's in 627 that the 40 years are going to be counted that end at the same period of time as the uh, 390 years, right? So you're going to have that 627 as a symbol. And that happens also in Millerite history of 622, which is um, the Passover of Josiah in 627, in which the, um, the 40 years are counted. So, so if we're going to look at it as the arrival of the second angel, we have attached to it the 1335. I mean, even though technically that's March 27th, that's going to be the, uh, the one with the 1533. But we can see how the 1260 and the 1335 and the 1290, these are all connected. And so, so I'm saying that in this line, this, this, which is a zoom into November 9th, 2019, um, we have this June 27th date, and it's going to be the arrival of the second angel, which would mean July 18th is going to be the formalization of that. If, if we're going to do it this way, I'm not saying this is the right way. And then March 7th would be the empowerment of this second angel's message. And December 26th would be the arrival of the third angel's message. That's that's how we would have to do it if we're going to take these seven way marks and lay them out and say that this is a line and um, that it's going to be a line that parallels with other lines. Because these are the way marks that we, we, we got from studying Judges chapter six. Now, there might be other ways that we could do this. Um, We could actually take the fleece one and the fleece two and make that a doubling, that that's both represents the midnight cry and and have some other date uh, be the arrival of the third angel's message in this movement. So, So that we might have an incomplete understanding of this. 
But that's that's one way of doing it, whether it's correct in how in all the details or whether it's correct in, in principle. Um, that's something we have to consider. Does that, does that make sense to people? No. No. We're not drawing a solid conclusion here. We're just examining these things. The way you're presenting it <clears throat> has a lot of very good logical points. Okay. Now, now, I still sort of feel that there's a date that the line of Gideon should go to. And because remember, we have uh, the fleece here at the end. So I'm just going to go here. So, uh, but it's more an implied end. Um, so let's move my Bible. Okay. So just hang on. <clears throat> so if we go back to chapter six, I mean, we have this test of the fleece, right? Um, and so that's, that's how it ends off. But remember, we're going to take this, this call that begins in 633, and we're going to use that to start the other line, right? Chapter seven, we're going to take this um, and we're going to take this blowing of the trumpet in 634 here, which in, um, in the line um, the, of, of chapter six, it's going to be symbol of July 18th. So these signs of the fleece, we're, we're, we're placing as something that happens after July 18th as these signs. But one of the things that we don't know about this line here, so if I go back, <clears throat> that we don't, we don't seem to understand about this line is that these are tests, but this, this study here that we had um, examining the foundation, it, it basically led to what ended up happening at the end of our 777 days. That is, in examining the foundation, um, we started to understand Millerite history's, uh, its relationship theologically to the mistakes that they made were the mistakes that we were making. Right. When we examined the foundation, we started to see that the foundation was laid correctly. But that just like in Millerite history, there were things that we did not understand fully. Um, that was part of our the reason for our disappointment. It's part of the reason, not the complete reason. But it's part of it. Right. So because of that, we started to present specific messages that were distancing us from the other groups, from the American group and the Canadian group. Now, some people might just say it's my own personality that got us distanced from the Canadian and the American group. Um, but however we want to look at it, we can see that there definitely was a difference on how we were understanding the lines how we were understanding the foundation so that when it came to this issue that because on December 25th, you know, Colin's going to present his study on Trump. Um, but there's definitely a division that occurs there at the end of the 777 days. So we, in, we invite um, the Canadian American group to participate in these, these different studies for that weekend, marking the end of December 25th. And we wanted to work together with them. That is, we wanted to, um, uh, you know, maybe have Elder Toby present some messages, but they didn't want to be connected with us in any way. They didn't want us on uh, the same meetings as them. Right? So they didn't want to have to listen to what we were saying. And so Colin presented his study on December 25th. We, we didn't interfere with their studies. Um, and that's when we started doing the Sunday morning studies was, you know, because of that, we started do, putting that in place. 
But if we're looking at this fleece, this December 26, 2021 fleece, I mean, has it been completed as a test? We can see fleece one came to a completion. You have the Holy Spirit on the fleece, the dew on the fleece, but not on the ground. Now, does this December 26 study, the one that we're presently in, understanding the line, lines, does it come to a close at some point that would we, we would mark as the end? And that is we would take fleece one and fleece two and put these two together as the midnight cry as a symbol because the midnight cry is a doubling and then put some other date that's going to mark the end of this fleece two. And, and whether that's January 11th, 2023, which is where I would tend to place it or some other date. Does that make sense to people? At some point, the situation on the fleece has to come to an end. Okay. Because I, I believe when we start looking at this more carefully, we're going to find that the fleece was a test. The situation with the 300 became a second test and that there would be a third test beyond that. Oh, okay. What do you mean a third case? <clears throat> Looking at when, when, we, when we get into it in chapter eight, Gideon will be confronted with yet another test. Okay. But that's going to be a different line. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So I'm putting January 23rd, 2023 here. Now, um, this first fleece uh, went for 187 presentations. I don't know if people remember that. But in examining the foundation, we ended at 187. And, you know, part of it had to do with things beyond our control, right? Um, of how we ended up with these studies being the way that they were. Um, now this December 26 study that we're in, that we started in December 26, 2021, if nothing happens, if we just continue as we are, which study number will we be when we get to January 12th, 2023? Well, actually, when we get to January 11th, so but technically I should put 11, 11, 12, because that's going to be the end of that line is the end of January 11th, the beginning of January 12th. So when we get to the end of this line, has anybody, anybody thought about that? Right now we're on study uh, 2,117, 217, right? Yeah, that's that's quite a conflation. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So 217, yesterday was 216. So when we get here, we're going to be on study number 264. January 11th will be study number 264. So would that be significant? As the end of this because that's where Colin's study comes to an end. And it's going to end on our study on this second fleece as 264. I don't 264 think that's a coincidence. Study. Okay. So, I mean, maybe it will change. Maybe something will happen and we'll miss a study or something or it won't work out that way. But that's how it's set up at the present time. You know, we don't plan to miss any of those studies. Um, So it's something to think about in that context, right? That maybe that's what this line is showing us right. in 2023. And of course that fits in 
with how we've understood the, the story of judges that it goes to 2023. <clears throat> okay, so now when we deal with, uh, let's, so let's go back to the scriptures here. When we go to uh, chapter seven again, so we got to verse 18. We had looked at this, the company divided into three camps, or the th three companies, right? And, and we would say that this is going to be the message of July 18th. And then we're going to see that Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came onto the outside of the camp in the beginning in the, of the middle watch, and they had but newly set the watch. They blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands. Now here, um, we have symbols. So he does this call of the trumpets, but we have always understood that Gideon defeating the Midianites here is a symbol of the Sunday law. Right. All right. OK. And so we had taken. So I'm just going to go back to this chart again. So if we were going to to place um, this here, I mean, normally what we would do is we would take. Uh, the 20th day of the ninth month, right? Which we had from the story of Ezra. And we marked that as December 25th, 2021, right? And would this then line up correctly or would we have to look at it in some other way? So I'm just, here we have November 9th, we have July 18th, we have December 25th, 2021. Um, and is this, is this the next way mark? Is that where we would uh, place the Sunday law? I mean, that's where we place the Sunday law in our 777 structure. Now, I'm going to say that chapter 8 is going to be a zoom into this way mark. Right. And here we, we sort of have this hinted because of the December 26th date. We sort of have this sort of connected um, with that line above. Right. I'll move this over. And then what we would have is we would have one more event, waymark, that would mark the arrival of the third angel's message that would line up with the line above. Now, of course, these. These are still parallel lines. They're still, they're in, they are a repeat and enlarge because they're really covering to some degree the same history, but it's the emphasis that's different. And, and the way marks themselves vary a little bit of what we're actually marking. But if this is a zoom in to the July 18th way mark, um, July 18th isn't the beginning or the end of it. It's still lined up like it is in the line above. But this is now Judges chapter seven. And then we would have to take the date here. So I should do this differently, but I won't. I'll just um, cut this out. I'll put this below. Oops. People understand what I'm saying here? And anybody got a comment on that? Would you mind restating what you were just going over? Okay, so here we have this, this way mark is representing the Sunday law, right? That's how we've understood it in our lines. And, and so the Sunday law occurs in this line of Judges chapter seven. And we're, we're lining it up with this symbol of the 20th day of the ninth month, right? Because that's how we did it. And we have the three companies, right? They're divided into three companies. And would the three companies represent the three days? So I'm adding some detail there, but can we take this December 25th date and line it up with what's above and call this the midnight cry? You know, it's, it's the symbol of the Sunday law in one line, 
here, it still has that symbol, but it's now a symbol of the midnight cry in this line of Judges chapter seven. All right. I don't know if people get what I'm what I'm asking here. Well, it looks like a, you know, when when you're looking at the at the first line, yeah, we come to this doubling on the fleece. But the application is being made on the second line that the midnight cry is coming in at on the 20th day of the ninth month and we're placing that as December 25th. So it, it's the combination of those two points, those two waymarks as we are examining more closely the line of Judges 7. Okay. Yeah. So, so if we're going to take, um, so if we're going to take this and we're going to give a, a verse, I, I prefer um, Judges um, 7.22 as the verse, because that's the blowing of the trumpets themselves, right? That's where they break the picture, pictures, right? Okay. And, and that's what we have as representing the Sunday law. Now, we could, of course, include the verses before that. But when you go to Judges 7.22, um, right, so it's going to be verse 19. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came outside the camp, right, in the middle watch. And they had newly set the watch. And they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands. And the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hands, with the trumpets in their right hand to blow withal. And they cried the sword of the Lord and the sword of Gideon. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp and all the host ran and cried and fled. And the 300 blew trumpets and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the host. And the host fled to Beth Shitta, to Zareth and to the border of Abel Mehola and unto Tabith. Right? So that is, I mean, so you could take this whole thing, but it's just here they're going to say um, that every man's sword is against his fellow. So this is all this, um, this battle that I'm just putting 722 there on the on the chart. <clears throat> So, so would we agree with how I'm setting that out, at least tentatively? <clears throat> so if we're going to do that, we would have to... Uh, we'd, we'd take um, Judges 723 and put this here, and we would have to give a date for it. And that date would be January 11th to 12th, 2023. So I'm going to give the same end date. So let's let's look at the scripture themselves, the scripture itself. <clears throat> So what happens in 723, the men of Israel gather themselves together out of Naphtali and out of Asher and out of all Manasseh and pursued after the Midianites. And Gideon sent the messengers throughout all Mount Ephraim saying, come down against the Midianites and take before them the waters unto Beth Bara and Jordan. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and took the waters unto Beth Bara and Jordan. And they took the two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb, and they slew Oreb and Zeb upon the rock Oreb, and Zeb they slew at the winepress of Zeb, and pursued Midian, and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon to the other side, Jordan. So in studying this before, we took Oreb and Zeb to be messages, correct? Correct. And these are the messages that are, one is called a raven, right? And the other is a wolf. Right. I believe that to be correct. 
I always forget which one is which, but. Um, the Oreb is the raven. And Zeb is the wolf, yes. Okay. And, and we took these to be the two messages, the two messages of, and this isn't saying anything about Odilia or Colin, but these two messages that are defeated here are the messages regarding Odilia's studies on the pandemics, that this is going to be the principal thing leading to the Sunday law, that basically the Sunday law is going to be centered around these pandemic mandates. So it doesn't become a type of the Sunday law, it actually becomes the Sunday law. And um, the other message being Collins, Collins' message regarding Trump. So that's how we looked at it before. And that these end with Collins' prediction. Okay, now, it's interesting as well with, with what you just did here. Yeah. Using verse 723. Mm -hmm. I mean, would there be a tie-in, a symbolic tie-in here with 723 BC? Yes, there's a symbolic tie-in with 723 BC. And um, uh, now I know September you know, it's the ninth month, but it also ties to September 23 as a date. Okay. Right. So because September used to be the seventh month, <clears throat> right? Now it's the ninth month. Um, and so when I see 723, I think of uh, Ellen White's vision in, Jan um, in uh, early writings, page 74, right? where it's supposed to be on September 23rd, but it's actually written on October 23rd. And also uh, to September 23rd, 2017, when I first present July 18th as a symbol of the prediction before midnight. And there's other 723s, which I, I can't recall at the moment. Um, but yeah, we would tie it to, to that. Now, now, part of that also is in 723 BC, just prior to that, there is going to be this call to northern Israel from Judah in connection with the fact that they're going to have this Passover. This is Hezekiah's call. So prior to uh, the siege of, of Samaria, there's going to be this call to the Samaritans. And, and here we have a call again in in this story of judges right so i mean it's obviously not just 723 you have these other verses as well but if if we look here we have in 723 the men of israel gathered together out of naphtali and out of asher and out of Almanes and pursued after the midianites and we're looking at the midianites as symbolizing this strife so this would be um really the upper room experience. Gideon sent messengers throughout all Mount Ephraim saying, come against the Midianites, take before them the waters unto Beth Bara and Jordan. And all the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and took the waters unto Beth Bara and Jordan. And they took two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb, and they slew Oreb upon the rock Oreb, and Zeb upon, they slew upon the winepress of Zeb and pursued Midian and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side Jordan. So, um, so we can go from 723 to 725 if we wanted to. Uh, we could look at it that way. So probably do it that way. What does it mean when they brought their heads to the other side of Jordan? Um, well, they brought their heads. That literal like yeah. yeah so they're, they're going to take their heads they cut off their heads and carried them across the jordan river
Now, of course, here symbolically, we're looking at this as a message. So this message, this uh, message that is, is attempting to present the truth. So it's not like there's some evil intent on the part of, of Colin and Odilio. And in fact, uh, the messages that they have have a great deal of light to them because the chronology is correct and fits in with the structures that we have found. Um, but that message has to come to an end. Does that seem like a fair assessment? I mean, that's how we've understood it when we've looked at it before. We've looked at it these, these two messages. So if we look at the lines themselves, do these lines parallel each other, but um, provide a different emphasis? Even though, you know, they are parallel lines. So, I mean, somebody could just say that's a repeat and enlarge. But I think the focus is different. Any, any thoughts on this? Because now we're going to put uh, Judges chapter eight here on this line. Right. It's kind of interesting to see how this, you know, the midnight cry on one line is not the midnight cry on another. Yeah. And, and that's, see, we saw this when we went through the story of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We could see how these lines, when we zoomed into the line of Abraham and then into the line of Isaac, that the lines in a sense ran parallel, but, but the way marks could shift they didn't and, and sometimes they'd be very similar uh, the lines wouldn't be that much different and then we had the line of joseph of course the fourth line um that um was part of this three one combination so so we're seeing the same thing here as we're looking at um what's happening in the movement under the 777 structure under those that period of time um you know it's it's quite clear that 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 itself is a zoom into something else right because it's it's not the big line so it's obviously a way mark on some other line that we've zoomed into Now, you know, and it, and it could be, and, and I'm not certain, but I mean, it's definitely connected to the 9-11 way mark to September 11th, um, whether it's a zoom into uh, the first one that is September 11th as tied to the empowerment of the first angel, that is, it's parallel to August 11th, 1840, or whether it's zoomed into um, the second one, which is the arrival of the second, and, and definitely it's leading to the midnight, to midnight, right? So our line is this line of the 777 structure is a zoom into a way mark on a bigger line. And we just thought we were on the bigger line, right? And if we take the line of Jeff, Jeff has 9-11, midnight, midnight cry, Sunday law as his line. So 
I lean towards it being 9-11, but um, the second 9-11, but the 777 structure that we have with this, these three dates, three primary dates, um, is, is a zoom into 9-11, but it still is leading us to midnight because that's where we ultimately have to end up if we're going to give the message of Samuel Snow at midnight at Boston, because that's what this movement appears to be about. Now it is about giving a warning of the Sunday law, but that's really what Boston is representing. So there has to be at some point that we get to that midnight waymark, but it doesn't seem like we're there yet. We've, we've had typical lines that have midnight and midnight cry in them, but we're not, we're not to that waymark. And when we get to that waymark, I mean, I'm not sure when we get there, but definitely we don't get there until this movement comes into unity. Agreed. Yeah. And and so, you know, what the disciples do in the upper room has to be something that we do. And, and it's not something that they have to do. I mean, they have to do it too, but it's something that we have to do. And so all of our messages are helping us focus upon our deficiencies. But we, we know that we have to come to this point, that we're not going to be able to just continue separating into smaller and smaller groups and accomplishing what God wants us to do. That there has to be a unity. And, and it's not just the American and Canadian groups. Um, in this movement right now, so you know, not everybody's aware because you're not communicating with people all over the world all the time, but there are people all through the world, all through the United States who have been a part of this movement who are not technically present, presently a part of it. That is, they don't join the American group or the Canadian group. Uh, they do watch my videos and they might be watching some of their videos as well. But they're studying, right? They're asking me questions. They're sending me emails. They're commenting on academia. They're, they're commenting on the YouTube videos occasionally. Um, they're communicating with me through WhatsApp. And we don't really know who all these people are. I mean, all they are to me is a name asking me questions. But there must be many, many people who have followed this message who are still watching. And, and so as this movement starts to come together, we can imagine that many of these people will start to, um, to participate more in what's happening. Right now, seeing the division in the movement, I don't think is that we need to have people coming into it right now, if you know what I mean. Okay, so... Now we're going to try to deal with this other line. We got about 35 minutes, so we can get started at least on Judges 8. Now, it's going to start with the men of Ephraim saying to Gideon, Why hast thou served us thus, that thou calledest not when thou wentest to fight with the Midianites? And they did chide him with him sharply. So now, did Gideon originally call the people of Ephraim prior to, you know, the battle. Yes. Okay. So why are they saying that he didn't? If we were to, if we were to take a look at a point from the spirit of prophecy. Okay. I think it would become eminently clear. Okay, so that point, because we've looked at this before, but we're, we're going to go there again. So where is that again? Signs of the Times, 
21st of July, 1881. Okay, so signs of the times. Yes, and it was July 21st, that was right. But also add to that, that it is paragraph seven. 18 what? 1881. So the publishment of this document is coming not very long before the passing of James White. Yeah. Yeah, so she says after, so I'll just bring it up here. So you can okay. All right. Bring so, it up on the screen. Yeah. If you want, I'll read it. Okay, if you want to read it. After his glorious victory over the Midianites, Gideon was subjected to another test, differing widely from those already given, but unexpected and peculiarly severe. He must now meet unjust accusation and censure. When, at his call, the men of Israel had rallied against the Midianites, the tribe of Ephraim had remained behind. They looked upon the effort as a perilous and doubtful undertaking, and as Gideon sent them no special invitation, they awaited themselves, they availed themselves of this excuse not to join their brethren. But when the news of Israel's triumph reached them, the Ephraimites were dissatisfied and envious because they had not shared it. Mm -hmm. so, so this is going to be a different type of test. Yes, a third type of test. Yeah. So when we look at uh, Judges, um, so here I'll go here, just hang on. So when we look at Judges 7, we do know the Ephraimites become involved, right? That is, when um, he does send messengers throughout all Mount Ephraim, this is after uh, the battle against the Midianites, that he does invite them. But he didn't invite them particularly prior to that. There's not a special invitation given to them directly. Correct. But it's implied, right? But then he's going to send messengers at this point to, uh, to uh, throughout all Mount Ephraim. And the Ephraimites are going to be involved. Right? So, so Ellen White has it right there. Now, this is a test, um, but it's a test that's of a different character. So if we're going to take Judges 8 verse 1, though, we're, get, we're going to have a different sort of line than we had with Judges 6 and 7. At least it's not going to line up the same. Correct. So, right. So it's going to start at a different point. So, and, and we have to try to understand what's happening here. They defeat the Midianites, but now they're going to be involved in an internal turmoil, right? So one of the things that, that we have to look at. So if God is calling this movement to the upper room, he's not calling us to something that's easy. Correct. Right. We're not moving towards ease. We're moving towards a trial. This movement is. We think we've had trials already. We hardly understand the trials that await us. They're not going to be easy tests to pass. Because they're going to reach to the very depths of our being a type of self-examination that we're not used to, a humbling of pride that we have never done. So 
So this test of this message, right? Because this is Gideon, but Gideon is symbolizing, we also have this movement is tied to that symbol of Gideon. So the men of Ephraim, who are they symbolizing? Or what are they symbolizing? Is it again a message? It has to be. Okay. Now, the men of Ephraim, they're going to be involved in uh, that battle at the end. <clears throat> and, and they're going to say here, okay, um, so I'm going to read this so that we can just refresh our memories. The men of Ephraim said unto him, why hast thou served us thus? that thou calledest us not when thou wentest to fight with the Midianites. And they did chide him with him sharply. And he said unto them, what have I done now in comparison with you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Ebezer? God hath delivered into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb, and Zeb. And what was I able to do in comparison of you? Then their anger was abated toward him when he had said that. Now, so this is the defeat of Oreb and Zeb. Now, yeah. here again, if we look at the spirit of prophecy. Yeah. In paragraph eight. Mm -hmm. We find the following. Gideon was not anxious to secure the honor to himself, for he knew that it belonged to the Lord alone. As soon as the Midianites were routed, Gideon had sent swift messengers, desiring the Ephraimites to seize the fords of the Jordan, that the fugitives might not escape. A large number of the enemy were slain, among whom were two of the chief princes of Midian. Thus, the men of Ephraim followed up the battle and helped complete the victory. Nevertheless, they were jealous and angry, as though Gideon were governed by his own will and judgment. They did not discern God's hand in the triumph of Israel. And this very fact proved that they were indeed unworthy to be used as his instruments on that occasion. They would have taken the honor to themselves instead of ascribing it to God. The wicked spirit manifested toward Gideon shows that they were not men who could be trusted, who would appreciate God's mercy and power in their deliverance. Mm -hmm. Now, Going back to this with July 18th, we know that destruction is going to fall upon Nashville. Mm -hmm. The purpose of this study has been for us to restudy scripturally and the spirit of prophecy to come to a clearer understanding of what's going on. But we know that there are many brothers and sisters that have been part of the movement that have now come out saying that July 18th was a mistake. Mm -hmm. Is it possible with this, with what Sister White wrote here, that these are going to be the ones that are coming saying, why didn't you call us? Hmm. Well, It's possible. Um, so if, if we're going to take this, this story, so let's, let's look at it this way. Um, here I have the chart again. So, so we're going to look at Judges 8. And Judges 8 is, is going to give us a line. We haven't drawn any of it yet. <clears throat> Now, where would we start this line? What are we going to do? Just going to say Judges 8 1, or are we going to start this somewhere else? Are we going to place 
the defeat of Oreb and Zeb here as the first way mark where Ephraim comes into the picture. Or how are we going to do that? Can we take, can we tie this line now and, <clears throat> and bring it to, um, Why couldn't we tie it to, to um, July 18th? Okay. So so you want to start it at July 18th? I'm just asking the question. Okay. Okay. So um, now we know that the Ephraimites, um, they come in chapter 7. And that's going to be in 724, 725, that we're going to have the Ephraimites now, because he's going to make this call to the Ephraimites. Well, when is this call to the Ephraimites made? In, in the context of how we look at July 18. Is this, is this at the end of this line dealing with, um, you know, what's happening presently? Is this where the call to the Ephraimites is made and they participate in this, the defeating of Oreb and Zeb? Because if Orb and Zeb are these messages that we're saying is Odilio's and Collins' messages, um, this would have to be a, this call is a message that defeats that. And so it would be, have to be something that occurs be prior to uh, January 11th, 2023. Correct. Okay. So the message of July 18th is going to send messengers to to Ephraim, which is another message. So July 18th message leads to another message. Now it happens after July 18th. So is it the message that's been going on since July 18th? I would say that the whole thing hinges on the message of July 18th. Okay. So we have this call. So this call starts at some point, um, wherever we want to mark that, whether we want to mark it July 23rd, you know, or not July 23rd, July 19th, the day after July 18th. Um, but it's going to lead to the defeat of Oreb and Zeb. So my, my tendency would take that this call that happens um, here because we took this 723 call and we, and we lined it up with let's let's look at the chart here again we, we lined this up with January 11th um, and 12th 2023 right? But I'm going to say that we can take this same call and we can place it at a different date, right? So we can take Judges um, 7.23. Well, actually, I guess we'd go, I'm going to even put it back further. Um, because in this story, we have July 18th as Judges 18. And so it's this defeating of Midian, this whole battle. Um, we would look at, at this whole history of this movement uh, summed up in this line. So I would say it's Judges 19 to 25. And that this is going to then be marked at a specific place. Um, and, and what place would we mark this? that this is the call, and this call would be July 19th, 2020. Now, that's just, oops. Now, is, is that reasonable or not? Maybe, 
because in this line, we have all that history. We have July 18th to this history. And I'm saying that this history now is, is going to be placed here, starting at July 19th as the call. But we're now going to give more detail to this way mark. That is this period of time here, whatever you want to call this here, from July 18th to December 25th, and then going on to January 11th, 2023, is now just going to be the first way mark here in this line. So, I mean, I could I could extend it to that whole period, but it, the call begins on July 19th, right? The of July 18th. And, and so now we're gonna we're gonna take that history and we're gonna lay these details out of of how that occurs. So we might just say the call is July nineteenth. Here, let's do it this way. We'll say the call is July nineteenth. How's that? Uh, judges seven nineteen. So judges seven nineteen. Even though we're in the line of July, we're in the line of judges eight. We're gonna go judges seven nineteen. So. But the focus here is on Judges chapter 8. Oh, What's that? Huh. I'm not okay. Now we have then the next way mark is going to be Judges 8 1, is what I'm saying. So, this again, these are just tentative ways of looking at it. So, Judges 8 1 is going to be um, what's, what's actually occurring there. It's Ephraim challenging Gideon. So where are we going to place that? And it, you know, we haven't read a lot of this other stuff as well, but we would have to place it somewhere in our history. Well, yeah. Do we place it in our history, or is this something that is yet to occur? Well, okay. So, I mean, well, I think it's something that's occurring. That maybe that would be a better place. A way that's to possible. Okay. Now, the reason I asked the question the way that I did. Yeah. When you read. The following four paragraphs in that portion of yeah. Signs of the Times, there are some questions that become relevant to what we're dealing with right now. Okay, so let's do that. Okay. So Ellen White, I'll read this here. The wisdom of God is displayed in the methods and instrumentalities employed to carry forward his work is foolishness to the boastful and self-confident because they know not the mystery of godliness. The Lord would teach his people at the present day the lessons of simple dependence upon that mighty arm which can overthrow the strongholds of Satan. The prayer of faith offered by God's humble, obedient, trusting people will bring them the victory. So this is presently what we have been studying, right? I think that this... This gives a good overview of everything we've been studying. Yeah, but specifically in this, in the study of righteousness by faith, in the studies that we have on, on Sabbath mornings. All of it. Yeah, and also what we've been seeing in this line. Everything, but this has been recent that it's, this focus has come in. Right. Yeah. Now, you know, as somebody who wasn't raised an Adventist, um, and this is me just from my perspective. I have not found Adventists very spiritual. That is, I would look at Adventists as boastful and self-confident. That's how they've always appeared to me in how they present themselves to the world. Um, and, and for this reason, because they do not know the mystery of godliness, Christ in you, the hope of glory. That is, as Adventists, we have this idea that our evangelistic series and all the different things we're doing are, are the Lord's work, but yet we're presenting a message that is basically impotent. We, we think we know the truth, but we don't know it. 
we we search sea and land to find one proselyte and make him whatever it is twofold fold tie twofold the child of hell that we ourselves are that's to me is what i see in adventism i don't see a very spiritual people in for the most part there's some very nice people in adventism um but that's my perspective as a human being it's like spiritual things when you present something spiritual they're not interested you know when i first became an adventist i was very surprised you know let's say there would be uh, a bible study at somebody's house and, and it wasn't much of a bible study it was more a social gathering you know people weren't really there to study the bible they were there to be seen they were there to talk to their friends um and and they would just give pat answers to any questions that were asked so god has been calling us through this message to understand something about ourselves that that we are not equipped to do the work that he would have us do because we trust almost wholly on upon our own understanding and our own methods and ideas on how to present the gospel. Right, so God's methods and instrumentalities are foolishness to Adventists. But that's also true of this movement, correct? Mm -hmm. I would agree. The most complete and perfect system which men have ever devised, apart from the power and wisdom of God, will prove a failure. While the humble means which God sanctions must succeed, the simple act of blowing a blast upon the trumpet by the army of Joshua around Jericho and by Gideon's little band about the host of Midian was made effectual through the power of God to overthrow the might of his enemies. Deep are the counsels of God. And the finite mind seeks in vain to comprehend them. The bullock standing between the altar for sacrifice and the plow in the furrow, ready for either, fitly represents the position which God's people should occupy. The Lord has no place in his work for the indolent and self-indulgent. Like the men of Ephraim, there are many at the present day who are ready to work diligently to secure honor to themselves. But unless they can do this, they will not work at all. And not only will they do nothing to themselves, but by example and influence, they will discourage others. Men of Ephraim, returning from the fords of the Jordan with the trophies of victory, addressed Gideon in terms of angry reproach. Why hast thou served us thus that thou calledest us not when thou wentest to fight with the Midianites? Okay, now yeah. consider this. Yeah. The way that this sentence is written, the men of Ephraim returning from the fords of the Jordan with the trophies of victory. In other words, they had come and returned with the spoils of the battle. Yeah. They had been blessed in getting the victory. Because God made it so, yet they turned on Gideon with anger. Mm -hmm. Why hast thou served us thus, that thou callest us not when thou wentst to fight the Midianites? They looked on Gideon as being self-serving. They applied to Gideon their their own character mm -hmm. isn't this representative of what we have seen in the movement since july 18th well yeah yeah he that judges another man does the same things so you're saying ephraim is a message yes yeah. And this message is going to bring Collins and Odilio's message to an end. Uh, 
<clears throat> what we're seeing here right now, sister, is there have been two messages that have been running within the movement. One message says that the other message is wrong and that the people that are giving that message should be tossed out. It is not a message of brotherly love. We are seeing some that are lifting up a, an idea that they are presenting. Now, we've seen multiple times within this, within this movement, within this message, people that did exactly the same thing to Elder Jeff. They wanted to replace Elder Jeff. They became jealous of Elder Jeff and felt that they were the successor and there were those that actually said that elder jeff had abandoned the message and that they were going to replace him now we're in a situation right now either we come together and do so with a spiritual with, with with a spirit of love one for another or we're going to approach things just like we're seeing the ephraimites did here with gideon now the way that i look at it is, is, is similar to yours to but there are some differences so first uh when Rosanna's asking about these being messages, we know people are attached to messages. So messages don't, um, don't exist without, without a messenger, right? There are people believing certain things. Now we know that the Ephraimites represent a message that is going to have a victory. Now the victory is over these, the, the message of Odilio and the message of Colin. Right? That's, that's the way we look at it. This is uh, Oreb and Zeb, right? Okay. So they can be defeated by the men of Ephraim. So to me, this is, is part of the same message. Now, we have Colin and, um, and Odilio presenting these two messages. But these messages are not accepted widely in the movement. That is, there's many people who don't accept either of these messages who are part of the American uh, and Canadian group, right? Okay. Right, we know that, correct? Not everybody at attending those meetings agrees with what Colin is saying. Correct. Right. So we know that from people's personal testimony regarding that. They don't agree with it. But, but that message is still going forth and and they might agree with parts of it but not the emphasis on, on where it's going so men, some people don't see trump as being re-elected and some people don't quite agree with the use of chronology in either colin's message or odilio's message right so we have a, a men of ephraim that are being called and by gideon's message when there is some kind of victory over the Midianites. But they're going to then say that they weren't called, right? Right. So I don't, I don't think I would attach this to people directly, but to sentiments that, that exist within this movement. No disagreement on my part. Okay. Because... What, what we see happening in the movement is that some people feel left out. They feel a bit disenfranchised. But the thing is, they want to have, um, there is the sentiment that people have that, that somehow they need to be considered more. And, and, and we don't know exactly how this, I mean, I'm not sure exactly how to fit all of it together. Because, you know, we tend to want to lean to it as these different groups. 
But I think it's quite clear that it, it's not as clear cut as that, that there isn't like the American Canadian group and then our group and we're the ones who are right and they're the ones who are wrong. Um, people themselves um, are trying to understand the truth. And just because you're in one group or another doesn't make you in the right. So this exactly. message of Gideon is the message of July 18th. And the message of Ephraim is a message that exists within this movement that um, is, is a message that is based upon jealousy. It's, it's going to be victorious to some degree in that it's going to, uh, when these predictions fail, but in coming together, what I see, this is all about a coming together in the upper room. This is a challenge that all of us are going to have to face. In a sense, the men of Ephraim represent all of us, not just somebody else. Yeah, Rosanna, you had a comment? Yeah, I just wasn't understanding because mm -hmm. Ephraim overtakes Orb and Zeb. Mm -hmm. um, so is there a message that overtakes these other mm -hmm. two messages? Yeah, and I would say that that even includes our message to some degree. That and is, yet, And yet Ephraim is still jealous of Gideon. Right, so we have in, uh, in ourselves, we have we have some of Ephraim and we have some of Gideon, right? Let's, say, let's look at it this way. If, you know, we, we can't imagine just because Collins and Odilia's prophecies fail that we're just in the right. We have to recognize that this isn't some sort of victory that we can gloat, but yet that's going to be the our nature. And so Ephraim is representing our nature in this defeat of Orb and Zeb. So Ephraim and Gideon are still part of the same message. They're, they're part of defeating the Midianites, but they're also part of us. So this is not about somebody else. This is about us. Are we the men of Ephraim? Are we angry? Right? You know, are we somehow self-seeking? Are we, do we have personal ambitions in some way? Do we have pride? Right? So that's the way that I would look at it. Uh, uh, to me, it's not an us and them uh, proposition here. These two met methods, messages, Ephraim's the message that's symbolized by Ephraim and the message symbolized by Gideon have to come together. That is, God has to somehow bring us to the upper room and we have to address the parts of our nature that have hindered the work, but also have been a part of the work. On, on that point, there I, I, I would have to take a little disagreement with you. Mm -hmm. God doesn't have to bring us to the upper room. We need to be willing to come to the upper room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have to go to the upper room. And if, if we're not willing to go to the upper room, God's not going to force us. No. And this is something that is, is not going to be easy. You can't help us if we're not willing to help ourselves. Exactly. Amen, amen, and amen. Mm -hmm. I didn't hear that. I said he's not going to be able to help us if we're not a willing participants. Okay, well, we're going to end here today. We'll come back to this um, tomorrow morning. So uh, let's close with prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning. May your Holy Spirit continue to work upon our hearts. 
We pray for those in this movement who are struggling to know the truth. We know that there's much confusion. And um, we know, Lord, that in order to um, be reconciled to our brother, we need to be reconciled to you. We need to truly see our need of you and to receive your Holy Spirit to give us victory in our lives. Um, be with each person. Bring us together again tomorrow morning to study your word is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everyone.